Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to the NEH Museums Grant Workshop. This is a presentation aimed at the museum community, and uh, my name is Jill Austin. I'm a senior program officer here in the Division of Public Programs at NEH. And uh, later on, I'll be joined by my colleagues, Margaret walker Clare, uh, who is Acting Deputy Director in the Division of Preservation and Access, and also Tatiana Ausima, who is a Senior Program Officer in the Office of Challenge Programs. This presentation is designed to introduce you to the NEH, uh, and also uh, we want to tell you about the grant opportunities we have that are geared toward museums. First, uh, though, we're going to hear from Anna Melda Radice, who is our Director of Public Programs and also our Acting Director of the Division of Preservation and Access. Good afternoon, everyone. And Jill, thank you for including me and uh, giving me the opportunity to say hello to everyone and to thank them for being here. The two most trusted institutions in the United States are museums and libraries. And the federal agency that does the most for museums, I don't know about libraries, but maybe libraries as well, but museums is the National Endowment for the Humanities. Today, you're going to hear about all of the possibilities that are open to museums for grants. Obviously, exhibitions, catalogs, educational programming, podcasts, challenge grants, care of collections, and really being a, a member of a community. Um, the one thing I want to tell people is uh, most of the people at the NEH have been in your shoes. They've been curators or museum directors. Um, we all know what it's like to write an application and maybe not get it or not get it the first time, but get it the second or third time. And I would just say as advice, please do not get discouraged. We're here because we want you to succeed. We're willing to read um, drafts. We're willing to answer questions. Uh, and we're willing to uh, give you feedback if your grant application doesn't quite make it the first time. Please understand that we get hundreds of wonderful applications and it's a very tough choice for our panelists and then eventually going up through the uh, council and to the chairman. So think of the agency and think of museum programs as an opportunity to have some help. We really believe in what you're doing and we will, would love it if all of you got grants, but that won't happen. So let's learn from Jill and the others some tips on how to give yourselves the best advantages. Thanks so much. I'd like to briefly go over today's agenda and some tips for you before we get started. Uh, we'll talk about what the NEH is. Uh, we'll also hear uh, about uh, many different grant opportunities and some sample projects that are really representative in the field. Uh, we'll be focusing today on grant opportunities in three different divisions in particular. And a little bit later, I'll discuss some additional options uh, in other uh, divisions in the agency, as well as how to find more information around our website about the process. Uh, useful tips, looking at the, at the red column on your screen, uh, we have a, a Q&A box going. You can pose questions in the Q&A box at any time. And some of our colleagues are available today to respond to those questions um, during our program. Uh, we'll also have some time at the end of the presentation today uh, to answer additional questions. You can also uh, reach out via email to the email addresses we've provided on our screens. Uh, if you like, you can turn on the closed captioning button, which is down at the bottom right of your screen if you need captioning. We also wanted to direct your attention to handouts available on that web page for the virtual workshops where you were able to connect to the, to the event today. Uh, we have a full list of grant contacts for the appropriate programs across the agency. We have a full list of 2021 grant deadlines. 
uh, tips for applications, and also ways to connect to the State Humanities Councils. And I'll talk about those uh, a little bit later as well. So what is the National Endowment for the Humanities? This is a federal agency. It was founded in 1965 to support all areas of the humanities through project-based grants using merit-based peer review. And it was established at the same time as its sister agency, the National Endowment for the Arts. At the NEH, we make grants in all areas of the humanities. We really welcome truly uh, grounded scholarship projects that offer interpretation through interdisciplinary or multiple dis uh, multidisciplinary work. NEH grants go to nonprofit institutions such as uh, the places you're working from and representing today, uh, museums and archives, libraries, colleges and universities, including university museums, public television, public television stations, radio stations, as well as eligible state and local or county government organizations. Um, different groups may be eligible for different kinds of grants, but all of the projects we support here are based in the humanities. Uh, an important reminder while we're talking about the differences between the NEH and the NEA is that we at the end, on the NEH side don't support the creative and performing arts. That's really the NEA's purview. And while we do our best to support uh, the humanities, we don't support humanitarian work. So that's an important distinction as well. So what are the humanities? Uh, we always have this question. Uh, these are disciplines that reflect on the meanings of the heritage, traditions, history, and culture of human beings, and, and can include an array of disciplines, including history and all of the sub-disciplines that go with that, including the history of the arts, such as art history and ethnomusicology, archaeology and anthropology as well, languages and literature, including literature uh, and language preservation, uh, jurisprudence, philosophy and ethics, and comparative religion, for examples. Uh, the, the NEH founding legislation really defined the humanities uh, to include these topics and not necessarily limited to them. And you can also get more information about those on our website. Um, we really uh, stray away from uh, sociological research. If those um, methods of research, the methodology is really rooted in humanistic approaches, that may be the case, but for, for the most part, uh, the, the research and the, and the project really needs to be oriented toward the humanities and not the social sciences. This is just a, a fun slide uh, just to uh, show you some color. This is an array of images that uh, we think brings to life the variety of the kinds of humanities projects that we funded over the years. Uh, you may be familiar with some of them, uh, especially uh, the bottom right corner, um, King Tut, uh, that, that 1976 tour of the treasure of Tutankhamun uh, really uh, uh, showcased uh, what the NEH can do in supporting widespread traveling exhibitions that were groundbreaking. Uh, we also support uh, film documentaries, uh, language preservation, uh, archival collections, uh, maintenance and preservation, digitization, as well as public discussions and civic engagement. I also wanted to take a moment to draw your attention to an important um, signature initiative here at the NEH, A More Perfect Union, America at 250. You'll be hearing more and more about this initiative as time goes by. Uh, this is uh, an initiative designed to demonstrate and enhance the critical role that the humanities play in our nation, while also supporting projects that will advance civic education and help Americans commemorate the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence in 2026, also known as the semi-quincentennial. Uh, for more information about this, and, and as I said, there will be more information coming and coming as, as we get closer to 2026. So keep checking in. You can check us on neh.gov forward slash 250 for more of that information. And, and this initiative really builds on those successive decades of investment in the humanities and projects that catalog, preserve, explain, and promote. American history, including diverse topics in American history. The grant opportunities and sample projects that we'll talk about today, as I mentioned, will focus on three divisions, 
Uh, we have seven offices and divisions here that include research, education, preservation, public programs, digital humanities, and that also support infrastructure in the humanities, which my colleague Tatiana will talk about today, through competitive grant programs. All of these are required to be rooted in significant humanities scholarship uh, with different kinds of outcomes aimed at different audiences. And of course, we're focusing on what museums can do today. Now I would like to introduce you to my division, the Division of Public Programs. We are all about the support of projects that bring analysis of humanities ideas to large, diverse public uh, audiences and that really uh, encourage public audiences to consider uh, important takeaways and, and statements of significance um, that, uh, that they can relate to in our history and, and perhaps make meaning on their own. What's important about what we support in the Division of Public Programs is that the interpretation uh, and public experiences must be grounded in that humanity scholarship, but also geared toward broad public audiences. So they really need to be made accessible. So we're looking at accessibility as well as public appeal here. We've got some key uh, grant programs that I wanted to draw your attention to with upcoming deadlines. The first one that's coming, uh, coming rather quickly is June 9th. Uh, this is for our digital projects for the public program. This is where we support websites, um, exclusively digital projects, um, <clears throat> including interpretive video games or humanities based video games, mobile apps for tours, historical tours, interactive touch screens, and other digital formats used to provide that analytical interpretation. Uh, so this is a deadline that we offer once a year, and I will give you a bit, of, bit more information about that in a, in a couple of minutes. The other big deadline you have a little bit more time for is on August 11th, and that is the deadline for public humanities projects. This is the program for exhibition, planning and interpretation, uh, planning and implementation, a historic site interpretation, humanities discussions. Uh, on the same, de uh, the same deadline, we also offer the Media Projects Film Documentary Program for films over 30 minutes in length, as well as the short documentaries program for films 30 minutes and under. And that's a, that's a relatively new program. Uh, museums are eligible to apply under media projects and short documentaries too, uh, but the bulk, uh, the bulk of, of the audience that we serve, as far as museums are concerned, come under public humanities projects. And that's what we'll really focus on here this afternoon. What do we support in public programs? Uh, we support public discussion, exhibitions and historic sites, as I, as I mentioned, and I'll provide a little bit more detail in a moment on that. Uh, mobile tours to get people out and about uh, the places where history was made. Websites and virtual environments. Documentary film and the radio and podcasts. And we've been uh, funding more and more podcast projects recently. Again, all of these projects need to have that interpretive framework uh, grounded. Uh, in the scholarship and the humanities disciplines to reach public audiences. And uh, you'll hear me repeat that again over the course of the afternoon because these, these, uh, these guidelines and these kinds of requirements and priorities are so important that my colleagues will, will repeat some of that information as well. Uh, for more information about these particular programs, you could also contact us at our main public programs email address, which is public programs as in pgms at neh.gov, and that's at the bottom of your screen. Uh, I couldn't help but include uh, an adorable photo of a visitor who is enjoying himself and learning in a museum. Uh, you'll see some pictures along the way. Uh, this is from an exhibition on Muslim cultures that we funded at the implementation level a few years back to the Children's Museum of Manhattan. Okay, getting back to this upcoming deadline on June 9th, uh, we have digital projects for the public. Uh, today, by the way, is Digital Humanities Day, and if you follow the hashtag DH2021, you can, or yes, 2021 that is, you can uh, follow uh, trends and current projects across the field of digital humanities. This deadline, as I mentioned, is offered once a year in June. So that means you've got some time over about a five month review period to then think about preparing for that next level. Uh, if you weren't successful or building toward that next 
proposal if you were successful. We offer three different funding levels here for digital projects. The discovery level, uh, which offers an award up to $30,000. This is for the early development of a project. You could be convening uh, scholars and advisors, bringing a media person to the table, a designer to really think about what that experience might be for users. Uh, and coming out of that program, uh, coming out of the end of that grant period, having decided on a platform and an experience that would really be ideal to communicate the kind of content that you want your audiences to get. Prototyping is the next level. Uh, this is uh, for maximum award of $100,000. And this is a really good critical in-between stage where you're building a proof of concept prototype, essentially doing a lot of testing on the way, working out the kinks, of shaping up those themes, what uh, what that experience will be for the user, and coming out of it with a, with a sturdy, live working prototype. The production level is the top level for a maximum award of $400,000 for the implementation and launch of that final product or experience to go live. So that is a critical stage of cutting through uh, your punch list, getting everything taken care of, making refinements in the design and the, the, the interface, and, and ultimately launching that project. Uh, for example, uh, uh, one of our art, uh, art uh, awardees is Gallup New Deal Art History in the Making. And this was an award, two awards actually, uh, funded to Gallup Arts in New Mexico. Um, this organization received a discovery award and a prototyping award to develop and test an inter interpretive website, as well as a mobile app that explores and documents the town's New Deal art and murals. I will say that you aren't required as an applicant to start at Discovery. You could, you could start at a higher level. Uh, you're also not required to have received a, a Discovery Award, for example, to be eligible for a prototyping award. Likewise, you're not uh, required to have received a prototyping award from us to be able to apply for production. If you have any questions about this, you can reach out to us. You can also look at the landing page uh, and the notice of funding opportunity as well. And I'll get more into where to find that information on our website later. Getting into the public humanities projects for that August 11th deadline. We have three types of projects, as I mentioned a moment ago, for exhibitions, historic sites, and humanities discussions. Uh, for exhibitions and historic sites, and that is really in a historic site interpretation, uh, we offer a planning level and an implementation level, as you can see on the screen here. Uh, planning is really about, again, like discovery for digital, bringing together scholars and designers to hone those themes, really think about what that experience is going to be like for your visitors and come out of it with a solid plan, ready to tackle uh, that next stage of implementation, making it real, making it, making that product and experience go live, essentially. Um, for planning, uh, the, the maximum awards usually up to $40,000. Uh, for implementation, it's usually up to $400,000 with a couple of distinctions. Um, in terms of exhibitions, we offer what we call a single site temporary exhibition for one, um, an exhibition project that doesn't quite fit or appeal to uh, a traveling program, let's say. Uh, the, the maximum award would be $40,000 or maximum award for 100, of $100,000 for implementation. And that's for a uh, an exhibition at your museum, again, it's not really geared to traveling, uh, but it's not permanent either. So it, it's uh, this is a new option outside of the regular program in which we require that exhibitions either be up semi-permanently for a minimum of three years or travel to uh, at least one other U.S. venue in addition to your own. Humanities Discussions is the third program that we offer under Public Humanities Projects. This is offered at the implementation level only for a maximum award of $250,000 currently. You must uh, prepare, uh, plan and prepare, and also tell us about in your application at least six public programs 
uh, that may be uh, face to face, or if we're still in our in our virtual world due to COVID, uh, perhaps they will be virtual. Uh, but uh, but you must account for six robust public programs. And humanities discussions is one of a few different programs that we have here at NEH that does require that you speak to a more perfect union to speak to that initiative. And we've got more information on that in our notice of funding opportunity and the landing page. Okay. I wanted to briefly mention that there are some special supplements for uh, a little bit more NEH resources to, to stretch uh, and benefit your project. Uh, at the planning level, a maximum of $75,000 may be awarded for exhibition projects that may be particularly complex or include multiple formats, uh, really planning for perhaps a traveling exhibition uh, with a community toolkit and outreach project and an array of public programs uh, that really go the extra mile. At the implementation level, there is an option for you uh, to request a position in the public humanities for an additional $50,000 a year for a maximum of two years to hire an entry level professional who has received an advanced degree in the humanities within the last five years. So that would be an additional request on top of the outright request that you may make for your implementation grant. Going beyond that, even bigger and more rare is the Chairman's Special Award uh, for implementation grants. If you are really uh, exceptional in your complex uh, multi-format approach with multiple partnerships and an exceptionally large national reach, uh, whether it could be it could be a huge and really in-depth regional reach or a national reach, you could increase that request up to a maximum of $1 million for such projects. Um, an example of that I will, I will share is the Strong National Museum of Play, which received that honorable designation along with extra funds in the amount of $700,000 in this case for a huge 24,000 square foot exhibition called Digital Worlds. And lastly, from, from my end and public programs, I also wanted to bring your attention to the NEH on the road traveling exhibition program, if you're not aware of it. Um, this is a program that um, is funded through public programs, but it's administered by the Mid-America Arts Alliance. You can get more information about it on the website nehontheroad.org, and you can um, apply for one of several traveling exhibitions and uh, get some supplemental funds up to $1,000 in support for related programming to accompany that staging of the exhibition. Um, the next available exhibit that's uh, has just uh, come out of development is World War I America. So you could check all of those options out on the website. This is particularly useful uh, as a program if your organization is regularly looking for traveling exhibitions that are humanities rich and affordable. Uh, now I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Margaret walker Clare to discuss uh, uh, the Division of Preservation and Access. All right, thanks so much, Jill. Um, I'm Margaret walker Clare. I'm the Acting Deputy Director in the Division of Preservation and Access. A substantial portion of our nation's cultural heritage and intellectual legacy is held in museums, as well as in libraries and archives. These repositories are responsible for preserving and making available collections of books, serials, manuscripts, sound recordings, still and moving images, works of art, historical objects, archeological artifacts, and rapidly expanding digital collections. I'm sure many of you in this webinar today care for collections such as these. The Division of Preservation and Access grant programs recognize that good stewardship of cultural resources requires equal attention to both preservation and access. And all of our programs focus on ensuring the long-term and wide availability of primary sources in the humanities. I'll spend the next few minutes going into detail about a few of the division's programs that are most relevant for museum professionals, but please visit the NEH website for a full listing of preservation and access programs. So the first are preservation assistance grants for smaller institutions. 
We consider this to be NEH's outreach program, and we try to make it easy to pull together an application and encourage first-time applicants to the agency. We hope that having a PAG grant, as we call them, can act as a helpful gateway to future federal grants for your organization, whether in this program or in others. We recognize that in small organizations, implementing preservation needs happens incrementally. So this program is designed to cover a wide range of needs and to encourage repeat applications and to support a combination of activities. At its heart, the point of the program is to enable small and mid-sized organizations to bring in outside experts in conservation and preservation to provide advice and to build capacity. What it funds. If your organization has not had a general preservation needs assessment, that's a great place to start and it can help to establish priorities uh, going forward. You'd want to identify a consultant whose preservation skills and experiences are related to the types of collections that are the focus of your project. For instance, you may want someone with a specialty in objects or paper or paintings. Similarly, you'd want to find a consultant who's, who is knowledgeable about preservation of collections in your type of institution. Second, maybe you have identified a specific issue in the preservation of your collections and desire a more focused consultation with a preservation professional. These more specific needs might include the care of digital collections, establishing environmental monitoring programs, emergency preparedness, and item level conservation surveys. Third, if a, con if a consultant has recommended that your organization might benefit from preservation supplies, such as acid-free storage boxes, archival photo sleeves, archival shelving and cabinets, or environmental monitoring equipment like data loggers and light meters, then you can request funds to purchase these. Purchasing supplies could also be combined with an assessment or a consultation, in which case your consultant could provide an estimated preliminary list uh, for budgeting purposes to include in the application. Fourth, preservation assistance grants uh, support professional development for staff and volunteers who work with cultural heritage collections. Education and training could be in preservation topics like handling and storage of collections, or topics that support enhanced access, such as best practices for cataloging and digitization. And training can happen uh, virtually or in person. Furthermore, if your organization is located within a federally declared disaster area, you may request funding to support further recovery efforts that are related to your collection. And I'm sure some of you are wondering about my asterisk by the funding limit. The funding limit for any combination of activities is $10,000 and cost sharing is not required. However, we do have a funding limit of $15,000 for projects that are involving consultations and planning that pertains to preparing for the commemoration of the 250th anniversary of American independence in 2026. Uh, this is aligned with that A More Perfect Union initiative that Jill mentioned earlier. So I'd like to share two examples of preservation assistance grants. The Museum of Nebraska Art in Kearney, Nebraska has a collection that includes works from the 18th century artist explorers who led the first expeditions to the territory, as well as 20th century and contemporary works that represent the history and culture of the state. The museum received a grant to hire a consultant who helped staff create long range collections management plan and advised on preservation supplies, which the museum purchased with grant funds. At the birthplace of Country Music Museum in Bristol, Tennessee, visitors can learn all about the evolution of this musical genre through interacting with collection items that include photographs, archival materials, cylinder recordings, studio master recordings, legacy audio playback mach machines, radio equipment, and microphones like the one you see pictured here. The museum used its preservation assistance grant to hire a consultant who visited the museum and conducted a preservation needs assessment. That report has informed a number of, project, of projects there, 
including planning for care of collections during a renovation and expansion project. Both of these projects are featured in blog posts on our website if you want to learn more about them. Next is sustaining cultural heritage collections. This is a grant program that supports sustainable and resilient improvements to advance preventive conservation measures, including managing relative humidity, temperature, light, and pollutants in collection spaces, providing protective storage enclosures and systems for collections, and safeguarding collections from theft, fire, floods, and other disasters. Sustainable approaches to, to preservation can contribute to an institution's financial health, reduce its use of fossil fuels, and benefit its green initiatives, all while ensuring that collections are well cared for and available for use in humanities programming, education, and research. Sustainable preventive conservation measures may also aim to prepare and plan for, absorb, respond to, recover from, and more successfully protect collections in the event of emergencies that may result from natural or human activity. This program has a planning level, which can provide funding to assemble an, inter an interdisciplinary team to plan for the types of complex projects that we tend to see requesting implementation level funding. However, a planning award is not a prerequisite for an implementation award. Planning projects might include evaluations of building systems and envelopes or examining non-mechanical alternatives to conventional energy sources for climate control. Implementation activities include incorporating new systems for lighting, fire suppression, security, and environmental control, uh, as well as comprehensive changes to storage systems. So two examples of SCHC projects, as we call this grant program. The Manhegan Museum in Manhegan, Maine is located on a remote island 12 miles off the coast. It's best known for prominent artists who were drawn to an art colony there from the mid 19th century to the 20th century. The museum's collection includes paintings by some of these artists, including Robert Henry, George Bellows, and Edward Hopper, as well as archeological artifacts from early Native American settlements and artifacts reflecting the fishing and lobstering industries that are still prominent there today. Monhegan Museum received a planning award first to investigate non-mechanical methods for reducing humidity, optimizing environmental control systems, and reducing energy consumption in collection storage and display spaces. An implementation grant awarded two years later supported improved lighting and non-mechanical climate control in some spaces as well as optimizing existing climate control systems in other spaces. The Glessner House Museum in Chicago, Illinois is a national historic landmark dating from the Gilded Age. The building was home to John and Francis Glessner who lived there from 1887 to the 1930s. And the museum interprets the building, the family and the decorative arts collection inside, mm -hmm. which includes examples of the early American arts and crafts movement with many pieces actually handcrafted for the family. Glessner House Museum has a current SCHC grant to support the implementation of a geothermal environmental control system, which would reduce its dependency on fossil fuels and reduce operating costs while providing more precise and holistic control of temperature and relative humidity for the collections. Both of these museums and their SCHC projects are featured in blog posts on our website if you're curious to learn more. The deadline for this program as well as for the preservation assistance grants will be in January 2022, so you've got plenty of time to prepare. And finally, museums may want to consider humanities collections and reference resources, which we call HCRR. This can strengthen efforts to extend the life of cultural heritage collections <coughs> and make their intellectual content widely accessible, often through the use of digital technology. Projects could address the holdings or activities of a single institution, or they may involve collaboration between institutions. Even in the case of a single institution project, working with specialists in other offices or departments or colleagues in other institutions 
often helps to ensure that proposed activities are achievable and will have the maximum impact for the humanities. This grant program also has a planning and an implementation level of funding. A planning award is not a prerequisite for, imp for an implementation award. So activities supported through HCRR include cataloging, digitization, developing databases and other digital resources, and planning for activities such as these. You might be wondering again about my asterisk next to the maximum funding for planning grants. Note that we do offer an additional $10,000 to projects that are supporting interinstitutional planning between smaller and larger organizations. Again, I'd like to share two examples of funded projects. So the Philadelphia Museum of Art has one of the foremost collections of work by the artist Marcel Duchamp. Working in collaboration with the Associ Association Marcel Duchamp and the Centre Pompidou in Paris, the PMA received both a planning and an implementation award to develop a digital archive on linked open data of over 60,000 documents created by or related to the work of Duchamp. And the Barnum Museum in Bridgeport, Connecticut received both planning and implementation level awards to develop the PT Barnum digital collection of items that are both that are at the museum and that are at the Bridgeport Public Library. The digital collection includes approximately 970 ar artifacts, ephemera, and archival materials related to the life, family, and business dealings of Barnum, including famous circus attractions such as Tom Thumb, Dumbo, Jenny Lind, and others. We don't have blog posts going into further detail on these two projects, but you can read their application narratives, which are posted among a few other successful application narratives on the program resource page for this grant program. The next deadline here is July 15th, 2021, and we'll read any draft you send us um, as long as it comes in by June 3rd. So know that staff that in preservation and access are happy to assist you with these and our division's other grant programs. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us at preservation at neh.gov. At this point, I will turn it over to my colleague, Tatiana Alsima from the Office of Challenge Programs. Great, thank you so much, Margaret. Um, and thanks to, to everyone for being here. Um, so I am Tatiana Ausima. I am a senior program officer in the Office of Challenge Programs at NEH. And I'm so glad um, to have all of you here today and to share some of what we're doing in the Office of Challenge Programs. The purpose of challenge grants is to strengthen the institutional base of the humanities by enabling physical infrastructure development and capacity building. And awards aim to help institutions secure long term support for their core activities and to expand efforts to preserve and create access to outstanding humanities materials. So as you might have guessed, um, fundraising is what sets challenge programs apart from most of the other grants at NEH, um, and it puts the challenge in the challenge grants. Uh, so all infrastructure and capacity building challenge grants require the institution to raise third party non-federal gifts for their proposed project. Projects can request up to $750,000 from the NEH to be matched at a one to one, three to one, or four to one ratio, depending on the institution type and the amount requested. And I'll talk a little bit more about the matching aspect of this program in a minute. The Office of Challenge Programs currently offers one grant program. Um, so as compared to my, my colleagues, Jill and Margaret, um, I'll just be talking about one grant line that we offer in the Office of Challenge Programs. Um, and those are infrastructure and capacity building challenge grants. There are two deadlines for this, May 18th, 2021. So it's coming up very soon. Um, and that's for projects that will start as early as March 1st, 2022. And then again, September 28th, 2021, for projects that will start as early as July 1st, 2022. You can apply for either deadline, but only once per calendar year. 
Within the infrastructure and capacity building grant program, there's two distinct tracks and each has its own notice of funding opportunity. The first track is for capital projects. Um, this is the bricks and mortar part of challenge and supports the design, purchase, construction, restoration, or renovation of facilities for humanities activities. You can purchase and install related movable and permanently affixed equipment for exhibiting, maintaining, monitoring, and protecting collections, whether they're in exhibit or on exhibit or in storage, and for critical building systems such as electrical, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, security, life safety, lighting, utilities, telecommunications, and energy management. So under the capital projects, these are large scale building projects, large renovations um, that are going to include exhibition areas, but also potentially storage areas, public facing areas are all eligible in under the capital projects uh, track. Um, you can construct a new building, you can renovate your gallery space. Um, and as you heard from Jill, public programs supports interpretive and anal analytical aspect of exhibitions. So you can't apply to challenge programs for exhibition planning, installation, or educational materials. You would go to public programs for those activities, but you can submit an application to install or renovate an exhibition or storage space um, that is focused on non-interpretive or analytical aspects of an exhibition, such as fixtures, exhibition cases, shelving, and lighting. The second track that we offer in infrastructure and capacity building projects is digital infrastructure. This supports the maintenance, modernization, and sustainability of existing digital projects and platforms. So for museums, this could include upgrading software and hardware systems, integrating your collection management software with digital assets, improving the user experience or upgrading a website, or digital preservation such as migrating data formats or changing to conform to preservation standards. So again, as you heard from Margaret, the Humanities Collections and Reference Resources Program, they're gonna help you do your preliminary digitization, build your preliminary website, but under infrastructure and capacity building, you could apply for matching funds to sustain that project for the long term. Eligible costs are hardware, software, associated personnel costs, contractors, and the development of fundraising plans to support the project. And again, these must be existing digital projects and platforms. The program would not be appropriate for the development of a single exhibition website or associated materials, but it would be a good source of funding to migrate your existing collection management system, develop search tools for the public, or ensure the long-term sustainability of a shared resource or database. And now I'm gonna talk about the matching requirements associated with challenge programs. So as I mentioned before, all challenge recipients must raise non-federal third-party gifts to support their projects. The matching ratio required to release funds depends on your institution type and the amount requested. There's no minimum amount that you can request from NEH, but the maximum for all projects is $750,000. Historically black colleges and universities, tribal colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions and two year community colleges are eligible for a one to one match, regardless of the amount requested from NEH. So in this scenario, successful applicants must raise $1 in gifts for every $1 they're requesting from NEH. All other applicants must raise $3 for every $1 for requests up to $500,000 and $4 of non-federal third-party gifts for every $1 in requests from $500,001 up to $750,000. And you can use up to 10% of your total project budget to support fundraising expenses. And in general, you have five years to raise all of these funds. As you can probably tell, infrastructure and capacity building challenge projects are very complex and are usually part of a much larger capital campaign, the execution of strategic plan or other long term planning. 
Since the program launched in 2017, approximately 50 to 60 percent of the awards have been to muse museums, historical societies, or other collecting institutions for projects ranging from new construction to HVAC upgrades, new windows, roofs, doors, installation of exhibitions, and upgrades to digital asset management systems. Because of the complexity of project activities and the associated fundraising, we encourage you to reach out directly to our program officers as early as possible to discuss your application and to involve your entire team in planning and grant writing. And this is especially true if you plan to apply to our upcoming May deadline. Um, so please take Anne's comments about reaching out to HART. You're not required to contact staff prior to submitting an application, but also know that we're here to help, um, particularly for these, these very complicated um, grants that involve both fundraising and construction and a number of other activities. So I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have in the chat or at the end of the presentation. Um, but for now, I'm going to turn it back over to Jill, who will touch on a few more of NEH's divisions and offices. Thank you so much, Tatiana. That was great. Uh, we really, as I said, wanted to focus today on public programs, preservation and access and challenge. But there are a couple of important offerings from uh, other divisions that we wanted to make you aware of that also uh, do serve museum uh, institutions and, and cultural organizations. One of those is the Division of Education Programs. Uh, this is a division that really funds projects that strengthen the teaching and learning in the humanities, largely through professional development and through use of innovative curricular programs that ultimately will reach uh, those teacher students. They really focus on uh, K through 12 educators. There are two uh, different uh, summer programs uh, for K through 12, two of those, and one for higher education faculty uh, over the summer. And you can see these deadlines here on your screen. Uh, there's another one for fall that I wanted to draw your attention to in particular. Uh, and these uh, programs bring together groups of humanities educators uh, for sometimes two or up to four weeks to study a particular humanities topic. Uh, so these, uh, the institutes for K through 12, uh, the institutes for higher education faculty and landmarks of history and culture uh, all have a deadline of February 15th, 2022. That de uh, more recent deadline for 2021 just passed, obviously. So you can, you know, you have nearly a full year uh, to aim for that following um, that summer. Through those programs, you can go in depth on a particular topic or a collection, a museum collection or stories uh, offered through museum interpretation. You can create and disseminate educational resources, uh, and you can bring a group of diverse educators to your institution. And I wanted to bring your attention to these because uh, a lot of the time universities are the applicants, the, the applying institutions, but uh, historical societies and museums are certainly able to apply and are frequent applicants. Uh, it may also be the case in the case of uh, Humanities Connections, uh, which uh, lower on the list there on the screen for a fall 21 dead, uh, 2021 deadline, uh, may, uh, may, uh, you may be involved as a museum as a, as a partner, perhaps with an, a university applicant. That may also be the case for the Institutes for Higher Education faculty as well. Or as I said, you may be the lead applicant on uh, the K through 12 Institute or Landmarks of American History and Culture, which really do attempt to connect to that location and a certain exhibition or collection that you may have that is the core content for, for whatever you all are exploring with those educators. You can also uh, apply, and again, many museums do apply, for uh, the program uh, Dialogues on the Experience of War. And that has uh, an October 14th deadline, so you've got some time to think about that as well. And I will uh, change the screen back over here. You've got a, a list here. I won't take the time to read all of them today, but you, you'll be able to play this back later. Uh, as far as the frequency of museum applicants to these different education programs and the range of uh, programs that they offer for professional development for educators, 
and where they're coming from. So they're really coming from all over the country. Uh, I'll start at the top just to give you some examples. Uh, summer programs uh, include uh, a, a great one on the path to citizenship for Asian uh, Pacific Americans in the Northwest uh, that was awarded to the Wing Luke Museum in Seattle. Uh, a great one on Mesa Verde National Park and Pueblo Indian history uh, that came and was host came in from and was hosted by Crow Canyon Archaeological Center in Colorado. Uh, and then uh, the First Amendment in 21st Century America hosted, uh, awarded to and hosted by the National Constitution Center, which is a kind of a classic, uh, more perfect union type of project at this point. So you can see a range. You can really go on the website too and look at recent awards, uh, look at what they've got on that, on that education landing page and explore the kinds of projects that are being funded and coming out of museum institutions. Uh, the Dialogues on the Experience of War offers a great opportunity to really connect with the veteran community in your area and veterans' families uh, and to really help process uh, and uh, get at that history and, and, and share that history with others in the community. Uh, the photo that you see on the, on the left is one from the writing process with veterans uh, that was hosted by the Historical Society of Pennsylvania and the Warrior Writers. And that was about reintegration in the community after you come back uh, to the United States. And then a great example from the National Humanities Center uh, worked with veterans who are teachers, classroom teachers, and how communities can learn more about the veterans experience and the teacher experience and how that can really be communicated to students in the classroom. So there are a lot of different things you can do with that versatile program. I encourage you to look at those, those guidelines. Another uh, important division we wanted to just make note of is the Office of Digital Humanities. And uh, Tatiana and Margaret, uh, as well as I, gave you a rundown on the different digital offerings that we uh, can make to you in support of your institutions and scholarship. Uh, the Office of Digital Humanities is another one that really works on um, the cutting edge of the digital, digital humanities within institutions. Uh, sometimes working with research institutions and scholars at universities who may often partner with educational or cultural institutions and museums. They tend to focus on the tools and the technologies and the methodologies that are really behind the scenes and involve nitty gritty kinds of work that ultimately can serve broad audiences in the humanities and, and uh, further humanities research. Uh, so there's a lot to dig into in this division. Uh, this division can help make the work uh, across the digital humanities possible, for example. There are a few different deadlines. I would encourage you to check them out. Uh, there is an upcoming deadline on June 24th for the Digital Humanities Advancement Grants. I'll give you a couple of examples of these in a moment. Uh, the Institutes for Advanced Topics in the Digital Humanities is coming up in 2022, March 2nd, 2022. So you've got some time to think about that one. I wanted to also draw your attention to an interesting new program uh, that is collaborative uh, across uh, the Atlantic. Um, this is uh, the last one that you see on the screen with a deadline of July 8th this year. This is the NEH AHRC or uh, Arts and Humanities Research Council out of the UK. Uh, that's the, the UK version of the NEH. They're offering new directions for digital scholarship in cultural institutions. And we are in the second year of offering this program that really requires a US cultural institution and a UK cultural institution to collaborate on a humanities project. And there is a list of the first year awards that were announced on our site, if you're interested. Uh, a, a great example of one of those that was awarded went to the Southern University of New Orleans uh, to think about ways to model digital leadership in museums. And uh, it's, it's part of um, trying to strengthen leadership in the cultural heritage field. And the UK partner for that was the University of Leicester. So there are some interesting new possibilities there for collaborations for museums. I just wanted to show you a couple of brief examples of what can be done in uh, ODH, as we call it. Uh, as I said, sometimes research institutions, faculty members at universities will partner with museums or historical societies to further the advancement 
of, of uh, use of technology in the humanities and to really help document and preserve history. In this case, uh, what you're looking at is a photo uh, for the virtual world kind of screenshot here of virtual world heritage Ohio. And this is uh, to help document and preserve and educate uh, the public on the Newark earthworks um, by the Hopewell culture. Uh, in Ohio. And so Ball State worked with Ohio History Connection and worked with uh, federally recognized American Indian tribes, including the Eastern Shawnee Tribe of Oklahoma and the Shawnee Tribe uh, to uh, to further this work. Um, there's a link uh, if you'd like to go there and, and read more about that one. Another uh, uh, idea, another example, if you're curious about what museums do with ODH, is through an institution that may be more familiar to you, the Folger Shakespeare Library. They're interested in technology too, and uh, we have funded three different iterations of an Institutes for Advanced Topics in the Digital Humanities Award to the Folger Library to work with scholars, uh, work with uh, designers, uh, tech people, people who really crunch that data and think about uh, the ways in which you can use technology to do uh, to do electronic research uh, and really analyze the state of research and awareness of Shakespeare's text. So uh, Shakespeare is, is really getting um, going digital as well. We also wanted to remind you about the Office of Federal State Partnerships, and this is the office that uh, administers uh, the state councils uh, for all 50 states around the country, as well as six jurisdictions, including Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands and American Samoa, and of course, the District of Columbia. Uh, they really um, use uh, part of our federal allocation to support the humanities at the state level and local and grassroots level. So about 40% of our uh, annual appropriation at NEH goes directly to each state council to help re-granting, uh, to offer need-based grants, and offer general support at that state level. And I wanted to just mention a couple of possibilities as far as uh, there's always something going on around the country, and I encourage you to check out your state council. Um, this winter was a hard winter in Texas, and uh, NEH uh, and Humanities Texas worked together uh, through a chairman's emergency grant to offer fast-track grants for winter storm recovery funds uh, to museums and cultural organizations that sustained collections damage uh, or had to cancel uh, programs this past February. So that's a good example of what's happening uh, in terms of need-based. And then as far as project-based support, uh, Michigan Humanities recently awarded uh, funds to help process a recently acquired collection of civil rights photographs uh, by the Jim Crow Museum of Racist Memorabilia at Ferris State University. Uh, so they can process that collection and also interpret it as an exhibition. Wanted to talk a little bit about eligibility. Uh, just as a good reminder, you all must be 501c3 nonprofits in order to apply for the programs that we've talked about here today. Uh, you can collaborate with an, in, uh, an international partner or institution, but the primary applicant yourself uh, must be a U.S. institution. The best place to get information about our endowment's work is on the website, neh.gov. Again, you found us here today through, uh, through this meeting, so you'll, uh, you'll be able to find this fairly easily, I hope. If you go to the top of our homepage uh, in the center, you can see that red arrow circling the word grants, and that's your starting point to explore the different grant opportunities offered by that uh, through across the agency. Uh, and the next slide I'll show you is the bottom of this screen, which shows you uh, all upcoming uh, grant programs, upcoming deadlines. You can search all past uh, grant programs, past awards, search all current gr uh, programs going on across the different divisions of the agency. And so if you are attracted to a certain deadline coming up under the featured grant programs, for example, you can click onto that and it will take you to what we call the grant uh, program information page, also known as a landing page for a grant program. You can get more information here. Uh, what we're seeing here on this slide is the top of a particular uh, uh, program page. Uh, the deadline arrow is directing your attention to the right hand column where you can see what the deadline is. If there's an optional draft deadline, um, as Margaret uh, mentioned, uh, we as NEH staff and program officers 
are uh, more than willing to read drafts before deadlines as long as we've got enough time by that deadline and give you some feedback. We also have contact information listed below that deadline information for uh, the general office number for you to, uh, to send questions to us and uh, we look forward to receiving those questions. Um, these kinds of pages have a lot of information on them. You'll see I've, I've just gone to the bottom of that sample page where you have a lot of links to choose from. Most important is the notice of funding opportunity, the NOFO, also known as the guidelines. Uh, below that, uh, you will see uh, an FAQ link uh, for frequently asked questions. Uh, just between the two of those, the NOFO and the award uh, uh, FAQ question, you'll also see that there is a link to the grants.gov uh, application package, and I will get to that in a moment. That is another important link for you to know about. You can also search this page for recent awards. If you're interested in this program, you can have a sense of the direction of what NEH has funded in this program uh, recently. And below that, uh, we have a, an array of sample narratives, which really will help you see how other successful applicants have organized their material, have made an argument for the significance of their humanities project, uh, the tone in which they write. Uh, and bear in mind, uh, these are great models for you. At the same time, they were all written under different guidelines for different deadlines. So uh, use them as inspiration, but don't take them, you know, take them with a grain of salt. Your guidelines may be different, a little bit different. Okay, so that, that link to the grant, uh, the opportunity package, as we call it, takes you to grants.gov, and this is another key website. Um, you're going to need to familiarize yourself with this, spend some time exploring. This is the site where you apply, you apply for all federal grants, grants.gov. Uh, so you'll be looking at our guidelines for that grant you're in interested in, but when it comes time to preparing and submitting the material, you go through grants.gov, so you, you'll need to really know it. You'll need to be registered under grants.gov to be able to submit. Uh, I would um, apply early. I wouldn't wait until the last few hours of a deadline. And I would always um, take advantage of the toll-free helpline or the email address. I think it's support at grants.gov if you're having trouble. Uh, grants.gov is a fairly smooth system, but it really is uh, a good idea to apply early. Don't wait until the last minute. And along with those reminders, uh, we wanted to again remind you that it's important to verify that you've got your SAM registration up to date, your institution entity record. You need to renew that ASAP in order to uh, be able to be awarded an NEH grant. So you should register with grants.gov as soon as you have an active SAM registration. And you can check uh, what the status is of your SAM registration by typing in your DUNS number at www.sam.gov. That can really take several weeks and there often is a backlog to that process. So start early, be on top of it and don't be surprised and disappointed when you find out you know, at the last minute that something's gone wrong with SAM. After you go through grants.gov and you have successfully submitted your application to us, uh, what happens next? Well, you have to wait for about a six month review period uh, after that deadline, uh, your uh, NEH application comes through our system from grants.gov and we start to work. So program staff will create peer review panels. That's our frontline review process. So we will have uh, peer reviewers from across the field, practitioners, curators, museum directors, and scholars looking at the proposals. Um, they will make recommendations to us as NEH staff uh, we also prepare information for our division deputy directors and directors uh, to think about these materials and what the strengths are, what the weaknesses are, and what, what seems to be competitive uh, in the eyes of the peer review. And then we prepare that material for the National Council, that body of 26 men and women uh, who meet three times a year with us to go over the proposals. And they may raise questions or ask us about uh, information, ask us for information about your projects, and we communicate that information. Uh, they, in turn, uh, give feedback to the chairman. 
and the chairman is the, the person who deliberates and takes all of the feedback and information under consideration to make the final decisions on funding. Uh, our current chairman is Adam Wolfson. He's our interim chairman, and he is the assistant chairman for programs at NEH. So after six months, you'll find out uh, whether or not you've been approved for funding. Two key uh, uh, things to keep in mind for success is that, um, you, as, as Anne said at the beginning of this uh, program, you may need to be re you may need to uh, reapply. You might not necessarily be successful the first time around. What's great is that you can take the feedback that you get from that peer review and from program officers and try to strengthen your application. Uh, that's the, the, the best route for success is to simply try. You must apply to be considered and then uh, get help from a program officer who will help recommend whether this idea you have or your project is the right fit for a certain program or whether or not you need to uh, apply to Margaret's program, for example, instead of my program that I'm focusing on. So we really do uh, make ourselves available to, to give that kind of feedback for museums. So we, we really do want to hear from you. A couple of other tips. We'd like to include this slide because, as I said before, we remind you of those important things to keep in mind because we know they're so important. So hold on to this slide, too, for future reference. Plan ahead. Again, read that notice of funding opportunity carefully. Uh, make sure you understand all that's required and all that you need to assemble before you spend a lot of time working on it. Um, speak with that program officer. Reach out to someone. Read the review criteria know what the reviewers are looking at and thinking about as they read your application. Understand your audience. You're writing to NEH, but you're writing to a lot of people who might not necessarily know as much about your topic and your institution's history and collection as you do. So write to a general audience to really persuade them to make your case for humanities funding and the significance of your project. And don't forget to proofread, pay attention to the details uh, like that SAM registration as well, and uh, talk to us. So I think that's, uh, that's all. I appreciate you uh, taking the time to listen to all of the feedback and information that we have for you today. Uh, you can look up this information later. You can uh, email us all through these various contacts. And I think we do have um, some time for questions. Thank you so much, Jill, Margaret, and Tatiana. Um, I think that I don't need to tell um, our participants today to, to go to the Q&A because you all have been asking some wonderful questions throughout the presentation, but you can continue to submit them um, now for our presenters. I will just say that this uh, a recording of this presentation will be available on NEH's website along with our YouTube channel. Um, if you have any questions, but you're not sure exactly to which division or program officer to direct them to, uh, you can just send it to congressional at neh.gov and we will put you in touch with the appropriate program officers. Um, a lot of the questions that have been asked already are published in the live event Q&A, um, but we will go ahead and talk about some of the more broadly applicable ones uh, now. We've got we've got some questions about what to do if people are unsure about their uh, institution's eligibility. So, for example, if they are a city run museum or if um, they're a state agency. Uh, yes, I, well, this is Jill. Uh, we are going to respond to these questions uh, via audio. Yes, uh, a state agency uh, such as a, a state history museum, for example, or a county historical a uh, museum would certainly be eligible. Uh, such government agencies are considered to be nonprofit. If for whatever reason uh, you have a question about a private institution or something like that, you can always reach out to us. Uh, I know that such institutions aren't always designated as 501c3s, uh, but yes, uh, most often than not, such institutions are eligible. So it's, it's always a good idea to check. All right, we have another one um, about whether restoration and preservation, whether those can be funded through a preservation assistance grant. Thanks, Ellen. I was just typing an answer there. 
Um, so for a preservation assistance grant, you cannot use those funds for actual conservation treatment of collections. And I am wondering if perhaps this was um, asked by someone in a historic house wondering about um, historic preservation of their building, which also would not be fundable through a preservation assistance grant. Uh, what you can do with a PAG is you can bring in the consultant who helps you to understand the extent of what is needed and to come up with the plan um, for moving forward. All right, I actually have another question, um, Margaret, that you already addressed in the chat, but um, it is something that we, we do get asked about fairly frequently. What do we consider a small or mid-sized institution? Oh, we see this one all the time. Uh, rest assured that this that there is no firm definition here. And in fact, being small is an encouragement. It is not um, a criteria of the review. What we do is we invite you to describe how you consider your institution to be small within your application within your application to a preservation assistance grant. All right. Um, we've also been asked whether people can apply for multiple NEH grants per year. We're seeing this particularly when it comes to both our standard grants and the current funding through the American Rescue Plan. Uh, Ellen, I'm sorry, would you mind repeating that question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've had multiple people ask whether they can have, um, they can apply for multiple NEH grants in the same year, whether that is, you know, a preservation grant and a public programs grant, or if it's one of our standard grants from the divisions, as well as a grant through the American Rescue Plan? That's a great question. Again, I think it's probably one of the questions we get asked most often. Uh, so a, a key consideration here is that you cannot have uh, a budget request and um, components of the exhibition or the project, I should say, overlap with another proposal that you may have. So each um, budget, uh, the request, the line items, uh, the, the components that would be covered under the grant cannot overlap with another one that you might submit to a different division. So um, a great example that Tatiana shared was you thinking about a, thinking about someone uh, applying for an exhibition of planning grant and then also thinking about what they could do as a museum uh, through a challenge grant, you know, thinking about the construction or renovation of a, of a gallery space versus the, the completion of an exhibition. And so if that was the case, you could potentially apply for a challenge grant and an exhibition planning grant under public programs uh, within the same period of time, as long as those components uh, the nature and the scope of the proposal, um, the components, what you're seeking funding for, the expenses, et cetera, do not overlap. Thank you, Jill. Um, can one of you please elaborate on what we mean when we say um, that grants need to be rooted in scholarship? And specifically for smaller institutions, how do they indicate that their programs are rooted in scholarship when they don't have a specific researcher on site or on staff? Well, this is Jill again. This is another uh, common question that, that we receive. So we really want to know that, uh, and of course I will say that museums, uh, museum curators, uh, educators, and directors often have their own expertise, which makes them a strength and an asset for that particular museum. But we also want to, uh, we want to think about projects that involve diverse perspectives, um, diverse minds, uh, diverse scholars, um, bringing to bear their own expertise and background on a topic. So we, we don't want a kind of one perspective uh, interpretation of history, so to speak. So it's important uh, if you are work if you're at a museum, uh, even a small museum, you can turn to uh, your local or state, uh, other local historical societies, uh, universities, university departments within your region or state, uh, that state council, uh, to think about uh, ways that you can branch out and incorporate other perspectives and expertise uh, to your project. Uh, it's really important to, to get a diverse group of, of people together thinking on it and helping you shape those themes. Uh, it's also important to uh, really think about your bibliography, you know, turn in a pretty robust bibliography. And also it's good, it's good for us to know and it's good for the reviewers to know how 
the the advisors are going to help you how they're going to help you and you know and inform that project so it will be important to really demonstrate in your proposal that these advisors and historians are taking an active role they're really interested and they're going to uh, help you think about the best ways to approach and interpret a certain issue in history. Thanks, Shell. Um, what should people do if they are unsure what the best category for them to apply is? And I'm going to go ahead and answer that one myself, actually. And <laughs> that one is talk to a program officer. Um, if you think that your program, your project might be a good fit for multiple NEH programs, our program officers are here to help. Um, that's that's what they're here for, and they they love to talk to potential applicants. We've also been asked about whether there are samples of successful grants available to view. Um, that is one of the things available on the landing page for each individual grant program. Um, I think a lot of the other uh, questions I'm seeing are great, um, are more uh, specific, targeted towards individual projects. Again, we do encourage you to reach out with out with those. We're happy to help you. Um, unless people have any additional questions um, at this time, um, I would just like to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, again, this presentation will be a be available online and we encourage you to reach out to us if you come up with anything later.